Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our um, DMVGL annual survey review uh, webinar. This is, I think, our fourth John time doing this um, yeah. together. Started back in COVID and um, was a way to kind of bring content to people who were you know, kind of stuck in their homes, wanting to stay connected in the industry, wanted to see what's going on, but not able to travel, go to events, uh, meet with people. And over the years, it's really been great to see um, not just delivery of content, but to see the content in transition. And I'm excited to join John Negus again from DNV this year. Really quick as an introduction, in case you don't know me, I'm Nate Richards. I'm the CEO of Enerex. We, um, our mission is to make it easy to buy and sell energy in competitive markets. Today, that looks like sales and commission software for brokers, sales and commission software for suppliers, and something called exchange that allows brokers and suppliers to connect their back offices to share data seamlessly without email and spreadsheets. And... Um, Pursuant to that mission, today isn't about NRX, today is really about what does it look like out there in competitive markets for the people who are selling energy, and we want to make it easier, and it starts with learning about the market, learning about trends, changes, things that are coming and going, things that are evolving over time, and DNV has been a great uh, partner in bringing uh, partner, not just to us, but to the industry in bringing uh, this scientific process-based data um, with trending. And I think we're going to see a lot of, I had a chance to sit with John yesterday and Khadija, thanks also for joining us from the DMV team. And just sort of go over uh, quickly this report, really some interesting takeaways. And um, with that, um, I'm going to head over to John and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Nate, for that intro. I, I think you're right. Four years. Uh, this marks the four-year uh, milestone of us sharing this, uh, sharing the results of this report. Is the screen share coming through okay? Yeah, I've got it okay. on my screen. Wonderful. We're going to rock and roll. So uh, a little background on the way that we do this research. We have a series of surveys that are distributed to energy suppliers, energy brokers, and then CNI customers. Uh, so whenever you see in the report anything listed as REP, that indicates the information came, came from the retail energy supplier survey, same thing with ABC and CNI. These surveys were in the field from July through early October of this year. And when you think of the conditions in the market at that time, it was the PJM capacity yeah. auction chaos that, that was hitting right around then. Um, so this was a really busy time uh, and, and I can't express my appreciation enough for everyone who uh, took the time to complete the survey, respond to us, provide the feedback that they're seeing in this market when customers are, are feeling, are gonna get ready to feel some pain from this. Um, we collaborated with you, Nate at Interex and Shannon at TIPA to help distribute the surveys through a couple other channels. So. You probably saw a thousand emails come from me or one of the other people in this group. And again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Nate touched on this earlier, but we've been recording metrics in this survey and in this report for the last three years. So we've got really consistent time series data that we can look at as a, a benchmark and, and trend analysis. So this year, I don't look at this report as a snapshot so much as uh, as a movie, you know, in a sense that we can see where we've come over the last few years. Uh, the full report you can see is about 60 pages long. This gives you an idea of the content that we're gonna cover. We don't have time to do 60 pages right now. We're covering all of that today, right? We're, we're gonna we, we're gonna be lucky <laughs> if we get through 10. Okay, right. so uh, getting right into this, I should mention too, uh, there's a ton of content and, and information on these slides. I've uh, board out some of it just so that we can stay focused on a few of the data points that we can discuss. Otherwise, we're going to get bogged down um, pretty heavy. So um, we're going to start with this uh, this section that looks at uh, the criteria and factors that each one of these groups 
uh, thinks is most important in their relationships with either a broker, supplier, or customer. So on the REP results that we got at the top of the list here, the number one criteria that a retailer looks for in an ABC partner is regulatory compliance. I think this really speaks to the kind of turbulence coming out of New York, additional scrutiny across uh, every market, really. And Connecticut, we saw a lot of changes last year. Connecticut, Maryland, you know, Ohio. Uh, regulators are taking a much closer look at the way this business is being done. And from a supplier standpoint, they are looking at their broker partners as an extension of, of them in the market. It's going to make them feel better if they know that the, the brokers are have everything in line. On <clears throat> the broker responses, top three criteria here, uh, ability to meet all conditions of the contract is the top response. I think the most interesting one is that second response. 76% of respondents said that the track record of previous deals with a supplier is one of the most important factors that they look for um, in, in these relationships. The deal that you're, you know, that you're looking at right now, pricing right now, depends on what uh, on the deal that you priced last week and last month, and the customers that you're. Uh, Probably also how you serve now. those customers that the broker brought you, right? This is ABC's looking at suppliers. Um, you know, were their bills correct? Did they have a good experience, right? Was the enrollment process smooth? How was the renewal painless? That kind of stuff, right? It, it, this is an ongoing uh, ongoing relationship. So um, again, I think it just speaks to the importance of maintaining clarity and, and uh, like open lines of communication between these groups, right? On the CNI side, energy resilience was the number one response that they looked for. How do you find that, John? Uh, yeah, so we look at it as encapsulated keeping, in that. Keeping the power on, no interruptions in service. Uh, if it does go out, you know, quick, uh, quick time to get back up. We know utilities are uh, primarily the ones responsible for all of this stuff. Maybe even exclusively. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting that this, even the CNI customer, these aren't even residential customers. These are large commercial and that they don't necessarily fully understand how the utility and the retailer have separation of responsibility. That that's a primary concern. Really interesting. And this is a, and this is a service uh, criteria. Terms, yeah. price. You know, you know, it's not what is not listed on here. Any of those kind of contractual aspects of the relationship. It's about the experience that the customer's having. And that's what we're gonna talk about a lot more today. So anyways, starting with this as the baseline, I think is- uh, Yeah, it's the optionality in those other two, flexible terms and stability options. I assume stability is some sort of sense of, um, you know, could I have some level of guarantee around what my price will be for some length of time? Help me understand my budget. I mean, I don't need the budget for this next year, next two years. Um, Okay, so this is the foundation that we're working from. Next, we're going to jump into the what we think of as the commodity sales playbook. We split the sales process into three phases. First is this pre-sales phase of communication. We've got a list of seven criteria that you can see that the brokers will uh, provide feedback about what's most important at this stage. Once we have an RFP auction pricing request, we move to the second phase of the process, We've got a similar list of criteria here. Once we have an executed contract, we're in phase three. And again, the a, a similar list of criteria to evaluate what's important at, at each, um, each one of these milestones. When we look at the pre-sales part of this, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here. You can play the webinar from last year and uh, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a whole lot of differences here because Responsiveness to needs, knowledgeable representatives are the two most important criteria in this part of the uh, process. Uh, make sure you're getting back to the broker quickly and make sure that your team has the information that they need to answer any questions that, that come up. Um, Constellation and NRG rank at the top of the large supplier list in this, um, 
in this phase. Smartest Energy and AP Gas and Electric are the leaders in the um, kind of smaller volume suppliers. Last thing I'll mention here, that um, graphic on the bottom left, we asked the suppliers, what's, what role would you like a channel partner to play in this, uh, in this process? Mm. And nearly 40% said that they wanted uh, the brokers to act as a customer management, kind of extension of their customer management team. And, you know, that indicates to me that they would like brokers to be more involved with the customer and provide information about the uh, customer's preferences in uh, the ways they're going to use energy, the ways they're understanding their energy bills, not just a kind of sales channel. You can see lead generation for energy is the second response there, which is that, uh, you know, hey, just bring me deals and, and we'll process them. But, uh, you know, we've seen a lot more, you know, even in the commission statements that we generate for suppliers uh, that get sent to brokers, a lot more um, information being communicated about the customer through those statements. Currently, when brokers and suppliers only have email and spreadsheet to go on, this is kind of the one document that gets looked on, looks at every month, right? Our commission statements, if you're a broker. And we see suppliers putting things like outstanding balance, uh, drop information, um, kind of withheld commissions for various things, whether it's credit concerns or whatnot, um, but kind of deputizing the broker to be managing that customer, like, hey, pay your bills. I mean, maybe so I can get paid, but yeah. you know, we want to have customers that pay their bills. Everybody wants that. And the world works when people pay their bills. And um, you know, just being the mouthpiece. Uh, and also explaining things like outages, you know, maybe helping the customer understand that outages aren't caused by the retailer or maybe even controllable by the retailer and helping them understand their product. Also, what they signed up for, you know, hey, you know, why is this number on my bill? Well, that's the pass through that, you know, because we got the price down, we accepted some amount of risk and that's that risk starting to show up there. So, you know, understanding what capacity is and those types of things. Um, you know, I think the broker is more and more expected to kind of not expected, but appreciated to, you know, educate that customer as well. I was going to comment yeah. back on smartest energy too. You know, um, we were just at, at the TIPA conference. And, uh, if you look at really how, uh, how they've, uh, grown over the last couple of years, they're a fairly new name to the U S obviously they're a UK retailer that came. Uh, to open up a U.S. Um, presence. And they really hired some great names out there in the industry. And I think that's really done well for them in terms of gaining broker uh, relationships and being seen. A lot of brokers see the supplier through their channel manager, whoever that might be. They might represent, right, all of that big brand through one person, you know, who is that brand to that broker. Um, so... I think it speaks to the quality of channel managers as well in a lot of cases. I think the what we just touched on, the broker is in a unique position to provide this information to a supplier. And again, this this business is built on relationships. And and Smartest Energy has been very thoughtful in the way that they've grown their business and and taken a lot of uh, been really respectful, I think, of the market to get there. You mentioned something just now, Nate. Um, about the, the way that so much this business is done on email and spreadsheets. <laughs> this graphic there in the is. middle, <laughs> preferred channel to exchange information with reps. 60% of uh, brokers prefer email, 24% on the digital platforms, right? The, the digital platform says, um, says to me that that's a um, uh, supplier portal, right? We were sure. talking about right. Today. Or a broker um, portal, you know, if you're someone like a Schneider or something like that, where you're kind of putting suppliers into your portal. But it's it's this portal mania. You log into my portal. You log, yeah. down, log into my portal. You know, whose portal is going to win? Um, yeah, I think we see a lot of portals still. But I'd be interesting to see that over time, like how much portal business is being done over time. And then, wow, to see two-thirds of the business 
I would say even higher than that, although this is the this kind of the question is preferred. You know, I think yeah. you know, to me, I look at this pie chart and I'm almost embarrassed after nearly 20 years in this industry. <laughs> I started when I was four, you know, uh, but nearly 20 years in this industry to still see the vast majority of commercial business being transacted over email and spreadsheet. And I, I do think there's a better way, you know, certainly no advertisement for what we do, but this is what we've been working on solving this exact problem by providing platforms and a way to connect. We're finally there. You know, we don't have to do it this way. And we heard about this at TIPA too, which is, Hey, how can we get our back offices connected and share some of this data about customers and not have to get it out of our commission statement or through, you know, ad hoc kind of methods. And we'd love to see the human to human and phone, you know, verbal conversation slice grow. And let's let those people work with people instead of this kind of cold uh, email and portal stuff. So yeah, definitely I think that's a good way to look resonant at resonant pie chart for me. Yeah, yeah. And you know what we were talking about the other day too. Um is email preferred because this is what's known. They know this works. They know right. that they can get things done this way. And and they haven't seen a better alternative yet. So, you know, if you've got a if you've got a better product to, to be able to switch to, then um you know, then we're just looking at adoption rates. But yeah. uh Absolutely. I, it's I the best of a bad lot. It's like the it's the devil you know. I mean, of email. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you said. You know, you can get the work done. It, you probably most people believe there could be a faster way. That email cannot possibly be the best way to get our work done. Um, and yet, you know, for us, it's sort of how do you get broker adoption? Well, you need suppliers on the other side. Well, how do you mm -hmm. get suppliers? Well, they say how many brokers do you have? You know, what kind of deal volume can we expect? And so it kind of becomes a chicken and egg type of problem. Even when you have the technology, you really need people to step out and say, hey, I want to be a part of the future and I'm going to lead in this in this way. And I believe in this future. And I think by the time I'm going to get out here ahead of this, and um, I think that potentially the early movers to this digital thing transacting, um, we have a, a pilot running on our exchange product. It's four minutes to get executable pricing and two minutes to get a contract versus email. Maybe you get it that day. Maybe you get it the next day. You ask for a contract in the morning. You maybe get it that afternoon. Uh, maybe you still can, can write the business that market day, or maybe you got to reprice in the morning and try to quickly turn it around. So email is just requires a human staring at an inbox, hitting refresh, processing through a queue of emails versus APIs, where you can literally talk to the back office pricing team directly um, and shuttle things like usage and, and prices and product information and pass throughs and all the stuff, which is a lot of data that we have to explain to our customers. If I'm a broker, um, it's a big payload of information. The other problem is with email, you only get really what makes it all the way to the customer. If I say, hey, here's a whole paragraph about what's yeah. in this product. These yeah. are passed through. And we think that's a good thing for this type of customer. And this, all of this stuff, context, what happens? It becomes that price goes in a cell and a spreadsheet. And you're counting on someone to tell your story. You know, what really gets, what really makes it all the way to the customer? Well, it's just all that. How do I, you know, if I'm a broker, it's like, no, it's a ton of work to do. Uh, to copy all of this context and story and stuff. It's just easy to just take that number and drop it in a spreadsheet. Nobody wants to be a number and a spreadsheet. So you have all of this context driving us right back to what? Email. So I don't know. There's certainly days I, I want to see a bright future and other days I want to throw up my hands and say, I think my children will be using email if they come. Here we are. Well, we're going to talk about <laughs> the, the ways that the industry has become more efficient in recent years too. This speaks a lot to that. And with email, you can, you can make things more efficient, but it's linear. Adopting a digital or more connected platform that takes that puts the scale of growth on a totally different trajectory. So it's getting into that. You know, is, is it a new technology? Is it a new platform? Something like that that's going to 
allow us to tap into this next level of efficiency. And you're setting us up for a couple of things we're going to talk about down the road. Um, but if we look at the four-year trends in the criteria that drive pre-sale um, success, <laughs> top two have been the top yeah. two for four years. So what was important in 2021 is important now. And I'm pro it's probably going to be important four years from now when we're doing this webinar in yeah. 2028. So um, for the suppliers that are looking to move up the rankings and and improve those relationships with brokers, these are the two areas to focus on. What's noticeable too, educational materials has been the lowest ranked criteria for the entire time we've done this research. So yeah. um, if you're looking for a place to put your resources, <laughs> fast turnaround and and highly skilled reps yeah can you turn around pricing when my customer calls me and says hey i'm ready to make a decision can you get me the latest and greatest if it's like oh i need a couple hours to turn that around somebody else is like hit the button on your screen and you've got our price you know you got a different experience there that ability to be responsive I also think it's interesting to see market coverage, although you just started surveying that last year. It'll be interesting to see how it trends yeah. over a longer period of time, but certainly an, an appreciation of more national coverage and more options within the same retail relationship. You know, does that speak to consolidation? Does that speak to national reps? And we know there's certainly a trend that the top, pick your number, five, eight, you know, retailers have the lion's share of the business. And then you got you know, 90 reps fighting over the 20% the of the market. Um, and, you know, brokers really appreciating that national uh, one relationship to get any type of customer taken care of uh, or gas and power where you see both commodities. Um, that's another good point. Yeah. So that's another interesting one to watch. So we'll keep tracking this stuff. I imagine we can write the story for next year already, though, if we, you know, if we keep these criteria the same. All right, if we jump to the pricing contracting playbook, lowest prices at the top. We all knew this. We all felt this. We'll see in a second. But this is the first time that lowest price has really been the top criteria, as indicated by the brokers. Um, Constellation NRG, again, on top of that uh, large supplier list, Smartest Energy and Freepoint are the leaders in that uh, emerging category. And last Thing to discuss on this slide is the average number of suppliers that an ABC worked with over the last 12 months. Mm. Most of it in between 10 to 20. So again, not necessarily a, a, a data point that you need to do a whole lot with, but keep in the back of your mind when you're out there competing for business, the brokers that you're working with, probably working with uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 other suppliers. To me, there's a lot of things on this page also. I think another one is, you know, these behind the meter, like project type mm -hmm. services, brokers not really caring so much that the retailer, they don't, they may not see the retailer as their go-to source for that type of service, that there are other non-retailers who do solar batteries, whatever. Uh, that's kind of an interesting one, you know, to see that down um, at the bottom. Um, I also see um, this, uh, the vast majority being between 10 and 20. If you think about this technology conversation, which is really, you know, the world we live in, how does that show up? That's kind of what's keeping us in email because I'm not, if I'm a broker, I'm not logging into yeah. 20 portals. What am I going to go put in type account numbers that are... <laughs> 40 characters long into 20 portals and start dates and what I want to see in terms. And then so somehow try to bring all of that data back together into a proposal back for a customer. It's really tough. You think about what the time needed to just get it priced. Yeah. Um, and so just easy to BCC 20 people and see what shows up, you know, just sort of blast it out there. Um, so, you know, I think it's again, driving us back to this without some sort of, one place I can go to send my price request and then one place to extract quote information with full product descriptions. 
Oh, what do you know? That's what we do. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is what we're trying to do. And you know, it's yeah. sort of like trying to convince the market to get out of email. It's a tough thing. It's a, t- it's a human behavior change problem that we're up against. Not a, do we have the technology to make it happen? And I think the what we're picking up in this report is that there are, what, what we're talking about is uh, qualitative in, in a lot of ways. This is quantitative. You know, this really shows the quantitative feedback here. All right, let me set this next piece up. Um, this year, we asked the CNI customers, we presented them with mm. six different sales models. And we said, what would you prefer your experience to look like when you're procuring power? Yeah, this and is great for brokers. This is not to say you need to go uh, reinvent the Tesla sales model for your power procurement and, and, and sourcing approach. This is more of kind of like a food for thought exercise so that when you're looking for inspiration about how does this sales process and experience evolve on the customer side, these are some places to go to, uh, they might be able to find some things that, that are going to uh, move you forward. So anyways, uh, we've got the characteristics listed here and I'll set up this next piece by just saying that the average sales cycle reported by the ABCs is about 30 days for a large customer. So you've got 30 days to compress this entire, to to like really make your impact and give the customer this experience. Coming back and the results from that question we just looked at, 22% of the customers said they want a Salesforce experience. 19% said they want the Tesla experience and then 17 indicated they want the Amazon experience. The common threads around these are, that I see, these are all digital, technologically advanced. It's a um, kind of user-driven experience in a lot of ways. And when you look at the Salesforce piece of this, the analytics and um, kind of data-driven insights that you can provide to a customer are going to go a long ways there. And that's what they're used to seeing. Uh, I guess notable what they don't want to see is the Apple experience where things are kind of tailored directly to the customer. You walk in, everything, everything feels nice and smooth. Um, they they don't necessarily want the farmer's market experience where it's like the, the local organic um, mm. side of things. It's a tech business. This is a tech driven industry and giving the customers an experience, a sales experience that feels in that, you know, like like it's moving forward. Like it has some of these characteristics of uh, the companies that are leading uh, technological uh, in the technological space is what's going to kind of set you apart. I would say. Yeah. It's interesting takeaway. Um, I wonder as brokers thinking about the world of, you know, let's call it 2000 brokerages that are out there, think about their own business yeah. models, how they yeah. would characterize their go to market. What is the, what is the, their own customer's experience with them and their sales approach? You know, are they one of these, they identify as one of these and what would it look like to, to transition or reinvent how they work with customers? And so I, the way I think about it too is giving the customer the right information at the right time too, when they're ready to hear it. So um, that's probably more art than science behind that as well. Okay, uh, this is the next piece we uh, we got into. We asked open response uh, of the of the brokers, which parts of the pricing process would you like to be automated? Which parts would you like to be hands on and more manual? So. Uh, the automated tasks, we've got this word cloud, you can see pricing, contracting come up quite a bit. <laughs> when you boil it down, I think we've got these three uh, takeaways from it. It's price generation, contract generation, and contract execution. On the manual side, a lot of similar uh, terms and phrases here, but uh, what kind of uh, came away when we distilled everything, it's complex contracting, it's large customer engagement and managed pricing. And then I got to show this with it. So uh, one response that we got said, take me out to lunch. 
<laughs> I think that's a great, uh, a great kind of response to that. Don't send me a gift card to whatever, right? <laughs> like, yeah. The, you know, yeah, let's have that be personal. Let's shake hands. There's a huge part of this market and this business that is still dependent on personal relationships. It speaks to the value of something like TIPA. And, you know, at the end of the day, it goes a long ways to be able to uh, sit down with someone for lunch and talk about the game, catch up about the kids, whatever it is, uh, th to make things more personal. So, um, Elizabeth, can we tee up the question for the audience now? And um, so we've got this distilled down to our three leading responses for automated and manual. What we're asking the audience to do is, if you got to pick one, what's the... Um, what would you like to be automated and what's the most important piece to be uh, continue on the manual side? So let that run for a second. I think the way the, that it's set up uh, is uh, just a list of these six items and then you pick one that you think uh, sh should be automated. Interesting to see how the so survey we'll get, yeah, uh, okay, we'll get one. reflects... Uh, uh, from the live poll. And I hope it's people asking for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Automated lunch. Send me yeah. a Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. COVID style. All right. Let's, uh... Uh, all right, maybe we can come back to uh, and look at the results of this later. In the interest of time, though, we'll keep things moving. And look at the uh, ranking of the criteria. So I mentioned this earlier, lowest price is now at the top. Look where this was back in 2021. This was the third most important criteria. Yeah, that's quite a Maybe trend. World back then, you know, and how it's changed to, to where we are today from a volatility standpoint, from this load growth uh, kind of environment that we're in right now, customers pay a lot more attention to the line items on their budget Maybe in 2021, you could uh, you could kind of win business without being that lowest price um, or really competitive on the pricing side of things. I don't. I think we're in a different space now. I think uh, the environment we're in right now is it can be driven by price in, in a big way. Is that, in, is that inflation? Is that, you know, businesses feeling like everything costs more and becoming more in general cost sensitive, not just for energy, but for, for everything. Um, I imagine I it's tough to, so. to pick between price transparency, you know, what's included in that price. Do I understand it? Is it clearly uh, uh, described to me what I'm paying for and what I'm getting, you know, to me, that's price transparency. And then, what is the drive out cost um, at the end of the day? And so, you know, again, it's not a huge surprise. I think we all felt how important price was for a long time. And now we're, now we're picking up this signal in a really clear way. Um, also might be a transition from <laughs> all in fixed products being 95% yeah. of what gets quoted to a, a whole lot, maybe the majority share of pass through. These days, we see a lot of pass-through products. Um, even in ERCOT, where all-in fix has been really a, a standard, uh, seeing pass-throughs today, whether it's securitization or uh, congestion charges, basis uh, from the zonal. So, you know, we're seeing a lot more fixed, but with pass-throughs, it helps get that nameplate price down. So. You know, is which one is the drop cause and which one is the effect? Hard to say. I mean, you mentioned it too. Uh, sophistication in these pricing options has has increased over the time period of this survey too. So, um, anyways, we all knew it, uh, and there it is. You know, right in front of you. <clears throat> After sales, executed contract, powers flowing, customers receiving bills. Make sure the bills are accurate. And if the customer has a question, get back to them quickly. Constellation and NRG have really kind of set themselves apart, I think, in, in this year's uh, results. They're the top two again. 
smartest energy and free point are on the top again. Um, you know, I, I think it speaks to the way smartest has uh, made a really strong effort to build these relationships, show up to the, uh, to the events that matter and, and we're picking it up here and, and just doing a good business. So um, last piece on, that I'll mention here is the uh, services that customers desire from their energy partners and energy cost analysis was the most, um, most frequent answer that we got here. Tell the customer how much they're paying and then give the customer an idea if they're getting what they pay for is how I was thinking about this. Um, are they getting a good deal? And um, help them understand that. So again, the and financing the, the uh, renewable is, component move up to number two here. I, I, I don't think that was as high over the past uh, in the bottom left there. I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I think that's um, the renewable piece is more interesting to customers now. And it feels more attainable to them. We're still not seeing it come through in a ton of contracting, but not nearly as much as for standard power deals. But there is, um, yeah, I, I guess I'll leave it at, you know, it feels more attainable to the, to the customer. Yeah. Um, Behind the meter again, ranking last in the broker broker preferences for suppliers, what they're looking for. And that's where it's been this whole time. Yeah. Um, yeah, there it is again on the- So okay. making sure accurate billing and timely response have been one and two for the last four years. And the, you know, the behind the meter stuff is not what's gonna help close a deal is, is when I, uh, is the way I read this. Um, all right, closing out this section, we've got feedback, open responses from the ABCs. We asked what additional information from the suppliers would help you generate revenue from renewable or non-commodity products. we got a couple of answers there. I like this one at the bottom where uh, respondent says, we work with manufacturers who are generally not interested in spending more for renewables, but they would like info about how to make things more efficient. So targeting a message to the customer around efficiency and taking that more holistic approach to their, uh, the way that they use energy is, uh, is a message that I think would be received by the customer as opposed to, here's a rec, buy this renewable uh, attribute. Um, same thing on the retailer side, what information could a, a broker share with you that's gonna help uh, provide more targeted solutions? Uh, and, and I like this uh, second answer here. If the supplier can have an understanding of how active the customer wants to be in their energy spending and their energy consumption, that's gonna give them an idea of, we need to put them on, a, on an active track with more advanced solutions or are they not as engaged and maybe they they go down a different track that's, uh, you know, lower resources, a little bit more hands off um, and, and focused on delivering quality service at a lower price. It's interesting here on these quotes, I look at the middle two on the, on the broker. <clears throat> one of them is about education and one of them is yeah. about behind the meter. Yeah. <laughs> services. I, so, the two lowest rank, ranked, you know, uh, perceived value. So uh, maybe it's because the suppliers are kind of meeting the existing high ranked needs and the kind of variable is on these lower, lower value, but maybe differentiator needs. I don't know exactly how to read that, but I thought that was interesting. I'm with you. I'm not exactly sure what signal that's sending, but there's interest in there somewhere. So yeah. Um, Love number one, by the way. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's a, that broker needs to reach out to me. That's right. We want to not not have anything to sell you, but just like we also believe in removing the back end, uh, like let the data just flow and not have to route it through email and humans on both sides, rekeying stuff. Let's just make it automated. We don't have to live in 1994 forever. 
whatever's left over from the lunch budget, put that into the back office. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay. We've got a couple more things to get through. We've got this customer segmentation playbook. We're going to start with the large customers. This is all we're going to talk about, really. So if we think about the deal flow, a large supplier is pricing just under 35 deals per day in this customer category. Um, and that's deals per region. These deals take about 5.1 rounds of pricing to complete. Uh, a bro, a supplier is winning about 20% of these deals. So for every five that they price, they're going to win one. Um, and then the ABCs are uh, requesting pricing from between six and seven suppliers on each one of these customer profiles. Uh, average delayed time to start is between four and five months. So from the time the deal is executed to power flow, and then these contracts are running for 2.2 years on average, which, I mean, this is a huge drop from what we were seeing in the market not, not too long ago, right? Was, Wait, what's the drop you said? The, it's the term, the average term? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I'm thinking of the top end when we were seeing, you know, eight, nine, 10 year deals in some cases. Mm. Um, now we're looking at the you know, average deal being less than three years. That's, I mean, I got to think that's market uptrend, right? Customers are like, you know, I don't want to be long when the market's up. Now, I think we can all agree $2 gas is not going to be, you know, a forever thing, especially if we turn on exports again significantly. I think it's going to certainly drive up uh, domestic uh, market gas prices. But um, maybe production comes up to meet that. Who knows? That's another sort of speculative, but gas isn't the isn't the only driver of, of energy prices as well. So, you know, certainly that's shorter than I would have expected. I, I would have guessed closer to three years. Um, and um, it's also really interesting that the 5.1 rounds of pricing. So if you think about this manual yeah. nature of, yeah. of pricing, and you got to do that five times for every deal. And you're only winning one out of five, right? So you're doing 25 yeah. pricing activities to win a single yeah. deal, single two-year deal. So it's not even like you're winning a five-year deal. Yeah. It's like you're going to do it. And you're going to price that deal again in 2.2 years. So on average. <laughs> so you think about how much work is done per unit booked margin right? Because I'm only booking 2.2 years of gross margin from a term perspective for 25, you know, pricing activities. So really interesting um, to me. That's, yeah, how that's a good way to put, those, together. put those metrics together too and think of- it Sounds like cost to acquire going up to me. I mean, that's kind of how I read it at the bottom line. And yeah, we might pick up some info on that a little bit later. Um, from start to finish, this process takes about 26 business days. And, and we'll see in a second that the way mm. it's pressed. On the reported commission side of this, ABCs responded that they're just under $2 a megawatt hour um, in, in commissions. Uh, the retailers indicated they were paying the brokers about $2.20. This is the first time that that relationship has kind of flipped in previous years we saw the uh, retailers um, kind of underestimating or, or under counting the, the commissions that were being paid out and brokers being a little bit higher than that. Now, to be clear for the audience, because I was confused on the pre-call call on this one, this is right. not what the retailer booked in retail right. gross margin. This is what retailers are estimating that they on average pay brokers for CNI deals right and the broker is kind correct. of estimating the same thing and you're saying who you know how close together are these who thinks it's more but it's the same number it's the broker margin taken on larger cni deals that's correct yeah that's the way that we that we pose the question um last piece that we can talk about here just to reinforce what we saw earlier uh lowest price is the most kind of frequent reason for renewal with the same supplier. So even if you're the incumbent supplier, you've got to have that low price to, um, to have a shot at renewal. Okay, let's look at it. Would you oh, back up one other thing? I think there's yeah. another thing here, which is this 4.7 months 
That's yeah. the that's the average forward start. Like how far out are we on average starting? Right. Deals? So I know a lot of brokers just look 90 days in, in the future on their renewal book. Um, this might be a takeaway. You need to look a little further ahead because from a competitive perspective, you don't want other brokers yeah. calling on your customers, right? Before you've even talked to them about this renewal. So might be an actionable takeaway for the brokers in the audience to look a little further out in their renewals uh, to action those for customers. And that's a good characteristic for this large customer segment too. I think that this is, you know, there's some really good takeaways from this, uh, from this side of the market. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at it from the customer side now, this is information that we got from the CNI survey. So, when a customer is evaluating their contract and, and looking at the procurement cycle, they generally start that process between five and six months before the contract expires. Mm. Um, they're looking at about seven bids from suppliers. They'll take about 22 days to evaluate the contracts, which matches up pretty well with the uh, data on the previous slide. Mm. And then, uh, a little some qualitative information about once the contract is executed, the most important criteria that they indicate energy resilience. So, you know, may, maybe there's an opportunity here to describe the relationship with the utility again and um, help the customer understand that the the supplier is not necessarily the one that uh, can be held accountable for all the resilience issues. Flipping that around. The least important criteria, a dedicated contact at the retailer or ABC, not very important for the customer, which, you know, is kind of at odds, I guess, with the way that we're describing this business being more personal and uh, trying to understand more about the customers. But I think if, you, if this is a very heavily brokered segment of the market. They may say, like, I'll, I'll talk to my broker if I have a question. I don't need a second relationship directly at the retailer. Uh, from a dedicated perspective, not nobody's picking up the phone, but I don't need a named account manager at the supplier itself. Maybe the broker is somehow meeting that need, so they don't see they see it as redundant. I don't know. Not undermining yeah. the value proposition of any suppliers out there, just trying to speculate how do we interpret this data. Yeah, and, and again, thinking of where to allocate resources, you don't need to have one account rep for every customer necessarily. You know, it, it can be uh, as long as as long as your team is equipped to handle requests and, and questions that are come, coming in. Um, last thing that I'll mention here is uh, customers in this category spend about seven days per month thinking about these energy procurement, energy management decisions. So, wow. you know, That's even, even large customers. It feels like a lot. I mean, to me, I don't know yeah. how it with you. I, well, I was thinking about this too. All right. So these customers have, uh, in many cases, full teams devoted to uh, sure. energy management, facility, energy use, those kind of things. And uh, you know, when they're, we're saying they spend, you know, between 30%, 30 and 40% of their time, on those energy management and procurement decisions, there's a lot of time they're spent doing something else too. I guess you know this is a, this is a fraction of their job is the is the takeaway. You know what else, uh, John? It occur occurred to me um, is this energy resilience being a value from the large supply large customer <clears throat> segment. It might give some advantage to someone like a branch energy that's bringing a dual battery retail supply product where they're putting a resiliency resource at the customer's location as part of their retail supply relationship. Um, you know, kind of meeting that resilience backup uh, generation uh, kind of need. It's not generation, but backup storage um, along with the competitive retail supply piece. So, who knows? That could that could play in their favor. I mean, I see energy resilience and I think storage. That's exactly yeah. where my brain goes too. So, um, I, you know, again, it's at odds with what we were talking about earlier with the behind the meter solutions and that really not moving the needle. But again, you know, we're picking up from the customers that this is a important part of the experience for them. So yeah, 
making that connection is is what we're talking about. Um, okay, trends in this side of the market. This I mentioned earlier. This is the first time so that ABCs have been uh, have reported commissions that are higher than what the retailers have reported for the last uh, two years until this year. Um, you can see it's in a pretty tight window. So we're about right around $2 a megawatt hour in, in commissions for this group. And again, only because um, Neil Turner has asked uh, live, thanks Neil for your question. Um, could the discrepancy between REP and ABC commissions be explained by having a greater number of brokers consultants in the market or did the data account for this? He was referencing the point um, a few slides back, but I think you're seeing kind of that data show back up here in the top right, which is the perceived amount that a broker is making on a large CNI deal, right? That's what we're looking at here. And it's from the perspective of a broker or from the perspective of a supplier, but it's both about what the broker is making and not what the broker makes versus what the supplier makes, just to kind of bring a little more clarity to that data. For yeah, now. that's that's correct. That's a good point. Important one to communicate here. Um, and I, it's not perfect, right? It's not a perfect representation, but I think we can use it as an indicator. And the fact that it's been pretty close over the last few years says that 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 two dollar megawatt hour number is pretty close to what we're. Yeah, it's probably the universal hip shots about two bucks for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so then if we look at some of these other metrics, rounds of pricing, the the thing that jumps out to me is the consistent decrease in the number of rounds of pricing, both by ABCs and REPs, just kind of leveled off on the retailer side of this, but the efficiency. Uh -huh. you know, what this says is. Things have gotten more efficient in recent years. Same thing in the days to complete the sales cycle. So the broker is always going to have a little bit more, uh, can be engaged with the customer for a little bit longer than the retailer. But both of these groups trending trending downwards. And so you look about 30 days, you're doing five refreshes over yeah. 30 calendar days. So you're refreshing weekly effectively to win a deal. Uh, interesting. And so what it feels like anyway. And so I would say, you know, there's a ton of narratives that we can kind of come up with to describe what's happening here. I would just pose this to our brokers and suppliers that are on the call to use this information kind of internally and say, the market's evolved. The market's become more yeah. efficient in the last three years. How do you stack up to that, right? What have you done? Yeah, what are you doing in this large customer segment that's um, kind of meeting the moment? So, and, and what can you apply to the other customer segments? So, um, I know we're just about at time here. Uh, we got one. We'll just mention the uh, metrics in ERCOT real quick. Um, same thing, number of deals priced per day, 28 for both large and medium customers, up to 51 on that small customer side. And then rounds of pricing. Uh, oh, you know, large sticks out to me here as well because the retailers are, what, two, uh, two rounds more than uh, what the brokers are kind of estimating here. So um, the brokers are really efficient in ERCOT. The retailers are, uh, you know, see things as taking a little bit longer. Could be perception, could be, yeah. you know, indicative versus executable pricing. Broker may not include indicative rounds as uh, real pricing. You know, give me a rough look at this customer versus calculate and give me executable. So I don't know. I, I don't know how you explain that spread of one and a half, two difference in refresh for large customers. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer on that one either, but it does stick out as a data point. <laughs> um, okay, and then the pricing contracting, a couple of uh, metrics we haven't mentioned yet, but in this market, the a supplier will maintain relationships with an average of 131 brokers. So you know, we're talking about 
the number of suppliers that price a deal being, you know, seven, maybe up to 15, you know, looking at that 10 to 20 suppliers that a broker would work with in the last year, 131 relationships that a supplier is managing on this side. Wow. In the last year, uh, suppliers have added almost 22 new broker relationships to their, um, uh, to, to the service and they have dropped service with about nine. So you net that out. Suppliers are working with more brokers this year than they were last year in ERCOT. Um. Um, and then last piece here, days to complete the sales cycle. And I think, you know, look how close it is in that, uh, across all of these. So yeah, the timing is really, uh, is matched up well in ERCOT. Um, that's, that closes out. That's all the content that I have. Uh, I want to say thank right you. On time. This is, uh, it's, it's always fun discussing this with you. Anyone on the call wants to reach out to me directly or, or anyone on the team, here's our contact info. And I guess we've got a few minutes for questions and discussion. Um, happy to open it up. And if we get the results of that poll, if we could take a look at that real quick. Oh. Yeah, if anybody's interested in the in the detailed survey data, reach out to John and the DMV team. You had contact information there. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Um, here's our poll. So it looks like price generation far and away is what we're looking to automate. Co okay. Follow my contracts. Someone still did, did get someone who bit at the. Uh, <laughs> 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 awesome. <laughs> well, we got several questions throughout. Uh, appreciate uh, the folks who asked. If there are any other uh, questions in the Q&A, we'll just hang out for a second to see if there's uh, any who would like to go. Big question for John. Uh, Gary at Energy Mark in Buffalo, New York. Gary, how you doing? Good. Late to the scene, unfortunately, where I was working on another project. But uh, just in general, the uh, use of third parties by suppliers uh, increase or decrease in that activity uh, in the U.S. I, I would say trending about the same. I, I think it looks to be about the same. The um, the large customer segment of the market is has a little bit more direct sales activity, but small and medium have been pretty consistently around 75, 80% deal flow through third parties. And that's been, that's been a pretty consistent number throughout. Okay. And uh, in state regulation, right? Texas, of course, all in states yeah. like Georgia. Is there anything moving in the direction now uh, to deregulate? You know, there's because certain states allow for natural gas and not electricity. Nevada, I think, is an example, except for the largest volume. Uh, where does that stand? And what, do you think it'll change as we move forward uh, with the new U.S. administration? Man, that is, uh, we need to get Richard Spilkey on to answer that one properly. Um, <laughs> I So there were movements towards additional deregulation in, oh God, I want to say Missouri. And uh, they helped me out here. I'm, I think Missouri and Louisiana were Louisiana, the, yeah. the two most promising markets that I saw in Rich's most recent presentation, which I want to say was... EMC in Vegas, maybe. I might be getting the conference wrong. Uh, but those are the two that come to mind. Virginia yeah, always trends, those trends will, you know, uh relate back to use of brokers and or direct sales forces. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, the you know, we're, I'm in New York State, so they've uh, redefined what an energy consultant is versus a, uh, uh, you know, they've sort of clouded the buyer's agency uh, arena by 
uh, naming brokers uh, what we used to call energy consultants. So they, they sort of reversed that. But um, in New York, uh, they've also imposed uh, new uh, rules and registration. Do you see that trend continuing nationwide? Uh, this is for third parties, uh, for the broker market or the third party uh, energy consultant. All have to register now. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any data to back this up, but my, if I you know, put my finger in the in the wind, I would say it looks. It, it seems like the trend is towards more, okay. if not regulation, than disclosure around uh, broker activities. Exactly. Well, the disclosure now, it's almost like a real estate contract for New York. In new contracts, you'll uh, any third party being paid is shown as a unitized cost or, or one-time cost, what have you. It has to be identified, which I think brings visibility to that and also makes it competitive for the first time. So, You're right. It's very much like real estate, right? Because not only do you have to disclose who's getting paid, but they that any payee. So if, if I paid John and John paid Gary, then both John and Gary have to be disclosed at the time of contract. So it can't right. be I pay John and disclose, and then John turns around and pays Gary later. And not only that, but both John and Gary have to be licensed. So right. it's uh it's very much like a real estate broker agent model. Yep. And I think it's a positive trend as half the transactions in large volume are done by third parties, not supplier direct, right? There's a lot of uh, people in between a supplier and end user. So it you know, brings the market goes a broker. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would tie it back to one of those first data points that we, that we discussed. I mean, State regulators are going to do are, are going to move slowly. They're going to uh, be too aggressive. You know, it, it's going to take a while for that to sort out. The suppliers want to work with brokers who have their regulatory uh, details in place. Uh, right. I, so that's if I were going to look for a place to drive towards more regulation and, and broker. Um, of disclosure is going to come from that side of the market. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and I you speculate that if if it works in New York, if customers are happy with it, if it doesn't break stuff, if we don't see a uh, an impact to the market liquidity of switching rates and 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 that kind of thing, um, I think that's going to be kind of the testing ground. I, I think you can see other PUCs. Um, PSCs, DPS, depending on right what what they go by, but other the other utility commissioners are watching what happens in New York. Uh, it's a big market, not the biggest, but um, I think if things go well and the market kind of renormalizes around this disclosure and licensure model, I think you can see it spread. Exactly. All right. Well, a couple of questions that I would uh, leave the audience with, and these, this is what Khadija and I have been talking about for the last few months. Um, Nate, you're part of this too. What's going to lead to this next jump in efficiency? You know, are we going to are we going to be able to do it with email, or is it is it a new technology or platform adoption? And then something to help us out. Which metrics do we need to measure to to do this? And yes. then, and then, um, so something for the audience to consider going forward. And as we sign off here, um, Nate, anything, I, I don't want to close us out here too early, but. No, we're good. We're over time. So I appreciate, uh, quite a few folks hanging out. Um, there is one more question around this $2 margin. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Uh, I tried to answer it with, uh, yeah. the $2 margin was on large commercial. I think everyone would agree yeah. that's too, too low for, the average com commission charged by brokers across all customer classes. Um, but could you kind of clarify what that $2 represents, John, for our listeners? So the way we asked the question of both brokers and suppliers, uh, what, how many dollars per megawatt hour do you charge in commissions and fees? And we split that out across 
small, medium, and large customer segments. We only looked at the large customer um, part of the playbook today. We've got data on the small and medium customer classes. Um, we've got metrics, similar metrics uh, looked at in ERCOT uh, for New England, PJM, and New York. So what we saw today is a, is a slice of the information that we have, but uh, to, you know, circling back to the point about commissions, um, yes, the data that we got is shows higher commissions for small and, and medium compared to what's shown for large. Great. I think that closes out our our commissions. Uh, I mean, our uh, our questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, certainly, guys, uh, you guys know how to get a hold of John um, or me. Um, anybody else in the DMV team? Um, DMV is making the slides available. I'll let John and the DMV team determine how to yeah, we'll reach out to them for if you want to get slides or want to want to have a conversation about the additional data in the report. Obviously, sixty pages. We got through maybe a dozen of that something today and only covered a certain graph. So it's very dense with information. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to talk about uh, efficiency, how to improve your efficiency on the software data side around energy sales, obviously we're here and just love partnering with uh, folks that want to talk about this industry, how we can make it better in pursuit of making it easy to buy and sell energy in competitive markets, which is our purpose at Interact. So thanks so much for coming out and wish everybody a great rest of your day and week and have a happy Thanksgiving. Everybody eat a lot of turkey and whatever is your, your jam for Thanksgiving. Um, and we'll uh, look forward to closing out the, the year in this business. That's right. Thank you very much, Nate. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Until next year, right? Yeah. <laughs>